There we go. I think. There we go. All right. I am live again. It's been a couple of weeks. Um, as you may notice, the backdrop behind me has changed because I have moved. And it's been a crazy couple of weeks. So I wasn't able to go live uh, last week. Let me make sure my phone is on mute. Um, but this week, I thought we would try something a little bit new. We're going to start talking about taking samples and making them sound more realistic. So here I have a short little snippet from a piece I've been working on uh, that I've put into a new DAW uh, file on Cubase, and we're gonna learn how to take these uh, tracks and make them sound much more realistic than they would right out of the box. So, uh, before we get started, the lesson plan will be available as usual after the lesson. Uh, I'll add the link to the description of this video. As the lesson continues, please feel free to throw in any comments, any suggestions, any questions, anything you've got on your mind, throw them in the comments. I would be more than happy to address them as we go on. But first, let's start all of this by giving a quick listen to the part that we're actually going to be working with. <laughs> So this is, a sh like I said, a short part from a piece I've been working on. I'll be uploading the full piece to YouTube soon. Um, but what we're going to be working on is how do we make each of these instruments sound more realistic? Because at the moment, all we have is just each part plugged in to perform the way it would um, just straight out of the sampler. So right now I'm working with Spitfire uh, uh prof studio strings professional all right this is one of my go-to libraries that i love to work with um the studio orchestra line just allows me to have control over each and every instrument i'm personally just not much of a fan of ensemble patches uh, for example i have the uh, Metro uh metropolis arc series which i love the sound i just don't like working with like quote high strings or low strings i like to know this is my violin one this is my violin two etc etc um, but the whole point behind creating a realistic performance in a DAW um, has to do with understanding your instruments because a real performance is expressive, all right? And what makes a performance expressive is manipulating things like volume and timbre and uh, sometimes even pitch live. So we'll say real performances are expressive all right this means they manipulate it uh, volume timbre and sometimes pitch in real time while sustaining individual notes all right and this is what's really at the core of understanding how you can take your DAW and make it sound re more realistic. You've got to try and figure out how does in like the, how does a violin perform expressively while playing an instrument. Um, with the string section in particular, bowing is going to be very important. And we'll discuss these different parts uh, why bowing is important in just a moment. We will get to specifics. But the general idea I'm trying to impress right now is that this is why instrumentation is important. This is why it's important to understand that a trumpet player performs their instrument by blowing into it and that they only have a finite amount of breath in their lungs before they have to take another breath. Or why a string player creates sound by bowing across their strings and that they only have a finite amount of length to their bow before they have to change directions. When you understand the physical needs of performing an instrument, you can start to understand how those impact the sound of your instrument in general. So starting, to, that's more of like the music nerd in me wanting to talk about all that. But for now, let's 
start working on the individual instruments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy ours, our pieces we're working with. I'm going to move them with one measure difference so that when we're done, we can come back and listen to the differences between these. So let's talk about step one. All right, let's see. Oh, awesome. Matt and Jack are in the com uh, conversation. Yes, I am on early. This is an hour earlier than I usually like to. This is an hour earlier than I was planning to. But like I said, I just moved to a new house and the landlord has plumbers coming in at 3 p.m. So that would be when I was normally working and so I figured I just had to move it up an hour. Um, but so yeah, step one to creating realistic strings, all right? Step one is just set up the material you're working with, all right? Enter your MIDI notes and set a general dynamic level using CC controller seven. So continuous controller number seven in MIDI. Um, this is step one. All right. So looking at just the violins, we already have all of the notes added. All right. So we have our part written out. That's nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to CC controller seven, which is the main volume of your track. And what you'll do here is you're just going to set a general level for your volume. For example, when I do it this way, I like to start with just 100 as my base. And then if I want it to get quieter later on, maybe I'm working as mezzo forte here. I want to move down, I'll move down uh, to mezzo piano. I'll lower it later like that. Um, this is one way you can do it. In Cubase, there is a much simpler way where you can actually use dynamic levels. So I'll go to articulations and dynamics. Right now, I don't have a uh, our, uh, expression map loaded, so all it is is dynamics. And here, I'm simply just going to add mezzo forte. If I wanted to change the dynamic level, I could click on this, select whichever one I want to work with. I'm going to start with mezzo forte. That's typically kind of the default dynamic for most music. Uh, and then you can grow or shrink from there. Now, to make sure this has the kind of desired effect I want, I'm going to go down to dynamics mapping. Here, I'm going to unclick change velocities. I'm going to click send to volume. I'm going to change it to CC controller seven, which is the main volume. So now I'm telling Cubase for volume, use these percentages here for my main volume. So if I say I want this to be mezzo forte, it's going to say, all right, this is now going to be 60% of the maximum volume this track is currently capable of. Um, what I like to do is I don't typically need such a wide range of dynamics. So I'll typically switch it like my lowest is going to be pianissimo and my loudest fortissimo. That gives a little bit more space to work with so that each shift isn't quite as dramatic. Um, and it just personally works well for me. Um, so those are the settings I'm going to use for this first one. We've got now our volume set. That's the first step. Let's go through and do that for the violas and the celli as well. I'm going to go into the violas. I'm going to change from velocity to articulations and dynamics. I'm going to do mezzo forte. And then I'm just going to make sure that for this track, I have the same settings that I had before. And then I will do the same for the celli. Articulations and dynamics, mezzo forte, go down to dynamics mapping, change velocity is gonna send a volume, gonna send it to main volume. I'm gonna make sure that my dynamic range is pianissimo to fortissimo. All right, so that is step one. So now we have a little bit of We have our stage set. All of the data is here. We have added the notes, and now we've made sure that all of the dynamic levels are set where we want them to be set. So step number two, let's bring this up. Step number two is actually, let's, we need to talk about something before we get to step number two. Um, because all, this is just the basics. This is setting the, the setting up our project. From here, this is where we start getting specific about the individual instruments. And here, we're talking about stringed instruments. This is where we really need to start discussing what impacts the sound of a stringed instrument. Now, the default way to play a violin, viola, celli, or, or cello, or bass 
is by taking a bow, which is a wooden rod with horsehair, and dragging it across the strings. This vibrates the string and it creates the sound. Now, the bow itself, this is important because the bowing then has an incredible impact on the sound. So there are essentially two basic premises that we need to talk about. The first one is about bowing direction. So there's basically two types of bow. There's an up bow, which means you start with your hand away from the instrument, you touch the tip of the bow to the string, and then you move up. Then you have the down bow, which means you start with your hand closer to the strings, and then you pull down away from the strings. So they're gonna see two basic types of bowing. Bowing, directions, up and down. Now this is incredibly important to know because an up bow has a very different sound and tendency than a down bow. Now the idea of bowing your notes is going to be form two premises that is at the core of all realistic string writing. All right, premises. Uh, the first one, let me make sure I get the order right because my lesson plan I wrote up. Um, yes, so all notes are performed with a single bowing motion. For example, let's say I'm bowing down and I play three notes while bowing down. They are all going to sound sound joined and connect or slash connected. In other words, they're going to sound legato. Notes that are separated by a change in bowing direction will sound much more separate and detached. This is actually called detaché performing. So let's say I'm playing one note by bowing down, then I play another note and at the same time, I change my bowing direction to be bowing up. These are both very important because when we're talking about step two has to do with this first premise. But the second premise is that whether a note is performed with an up bow or down bow will have a significant impact on the type, type of sound produced. So essentially the idea here is that we talked about how an, a, a down bow starts with your hand close to the strings. You're able to produce a lot more pressure on the strings when your hand is right by them. So when you pull down, you can produce pressure, but that pressure is released as your hand moves further away. This results in an overall loss in power and pressure. So it's called a decrescendo, something that gets softer as you move away from the strings. The opposite is true for an up bow. If you start with the tip of the bow, you can't produce a lot of pressure, so it's gonna have a softer sound, and as you move your hand closer, you're applying more pressure and it gets louder. Now, there are certainly talented players who can minimize that difference, but you don't necessarily want to minimize that difference if you are trying to create a realistic performance. You want to try and play to those differences to create something that sounds like a real person could be playing that. So now that we have these two premises in mind, we can now step uh, a move on to step number two. And step number two, like I said, has to do with that initial premise. We want to mimic the phrasing slash bowing of your notes by linking some together and detaching others. All right, um, now with this, there are a couple different steps that we're gonna wanna keep in mind. There are a couple different ideas. Um, these are typically marked by slurs. All right, so here we have the part that we're working with today. A slur mark joins these notes together saying, these are all played with one bowing. All right, if notes are not connected by a slur, it means switch bowing direction. So let's say we started with a down bow here, right? We're down bowing for this first note. We're not changing direction, same bowing direction, same bowing direction, boom. This very last note does not have a slur over it. So that means change directions. After this, so we go from down bow to up bow. Then for this next note, again, there's no slur. So we change again. No slur, we change again. No slur connecting these two. Once again, you change direction, but this time 
we have three notes that are combined. So you are going to pull down slowly while playing all three of those notes together with one single bowing motion. Now, when we talked about that premise, these three notes are going to be played legato, meaning that this C runs into this B and it runs into this A. But since these two notes are separated by a separate bowing direction, we need to break that pattern, break that collection a little bit. So this is why I typically like to start my bowing in notation. For me, it just makes sense. For some people, not so much, but that's up to you. When you are deciding on your bowing, I do have a few tips for you. All right, so regarding personality. Personality, all right? Um, the str more forceful, forceful, let me see, and powerful pieces can use more frequent bowing direction changes. All right, so you can very simply, if you're doing a very fast asinato, change bowing direction every single note. That's perfectly fine. However, if you want something more lyrical, lyrical and legato passages require more slurs or fewer, I should say, uh, e.g. In other words, I cannot type today, uh, fewer bowing direction changes. Now this is supposed to be a sad piece, all right? So I want to create fewer bowing direction changes. Now what I'm gonna do is once I figured out my bowing, it's a very simple matter of just having them bleed into each other a little bit. So let's say I wanted these two notes. Oh wait, sorry, I'm moving on too quickly. I forgot the other tips. Uh, sorry. Um, the next tip is that you don't, don't want to slur more than two to three beats together unless you're working with a faster tempo. Remember, there is a finite amount of length to a bow, all right? So if you are telling a string section, just do this entire phrase in one bowing motion, they're gonna get very pissed at you because they're gonna reach the end of the bow and now they have to figure out how to try to mimic the sound you're looking for. So again, with these slurs, if you'll notice, oh, did I exit? Oh, I exited. All right, so I'm not going to be able to pull that back up just yet. Um, but if you notice, I maintained just two to three notes maximum bow. There were a couple moments where I was getting a little risky, but for the most part, I kept this rule. Two to three beats max being played with one bowing direction. If you're working with a much faster tempo, you can, of course, speed that up. Um, the next tip is that you don't want to slur notes across a bar line. All right, so here, essentially, I don't want to slur these two notes together. All right, because you want to be able to alternate. This keeps things simple. If you're trying to slur too many notes across, it can obfuscate your meaning making. It makes it less clear. It can make it a little more complicated. So unless you are very experienced with stringed instruments and perhaps are a string player yourself, it's just a general idea. Don't slur notes across a line. Um, then the last one is that you can't slur two identical notes, I should say two notes, of identical pitch if, okay, there we go, into each other. All right, technically you could, but it wouldn't sound like two notes. Um, so if I were to take these two D4 notes and slur them together, it wouldn't sound like an eighth note and a dotted quarter note, it would sound like a half note. All right, it wouldn't get that articulation. I'd lose the shape of my melody. So with these tips in mind, it's a simple matter of going through and trying to locate where are we going to have bowing changes. So these three notes are going to be bowed together. So what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to simply, there are different faster ways you can do this, but I'm going to find a very short amount. And, oh, these are already... One second, that's probably for, oops. That's probably from, because I did just copy and paste and then try to change things. But I want to go through 
this note, see how they are right at each other? I want to highlight these three are going to be together, so I'm going to overlap them ever so slightly. So this overlaps into that, and boom, we've got that. However, these two notes are where I'm changing bowing direction. So I'm going to make sure there is a slight, ch a slight gap. And this is essentially what I'm going to do for each of these. Anytime there's a change in bow direction, make sure there's a gap. Anytime there is overlap, I want to make sure they overlap as they are. And it looks like this is already taken care of. Because uh, I, like I said, copy and pasted this from the other arrangement. Um, but go through, make sure that, again, if all notes are supposed to be played with a single bowing line, make sure they overlap. If notes are not supposed to be done, if you're supposed to change directions, create a gap. So let's write that in the notes. Actually, you know what? We don't need to write in that notes because you will have all of this available uh, after the stream. All right, so step number three. Number three, remember step number two had to do with premise number one. The idea that notes that are played in a single bowing motion will be kind of run into each other. They'll be performed legato. Notes that are performed with separate bowing motions are going to sound detached. Premise number two is that an up bow and a down bow have a very different sound. All right, so step number three is to establish your bowing pattern by manipulating velocity. All right, so I've already kind of explained that an up bow is, up bows are softer than down bows. The idea is that an up bow starts with your hand far away from the strings, so you can't apply as much pressure as you can with the down bow, which starts with your hand very close to the strings. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through each bowing motion. Let's go. Go through your bowing pattern as established by step two, and give all bow uh, down bows. Give all, we say, uh, up bows, I mean, a softer velocity. Um, Let's see here. Is there any notes I forgot to mention? Um, oh, yeah, I should probably mention the defaults. All right, so the default pattern, the default pattern is to give down beats a down bow. And comparatively, comparatively weaker beats, I spelled comparatively wrong. Comparatively, that doesn't look right either, but I'm done. All right, comparatively weaker beats will be given an up bow. However, another strategy is keeping in mind that up bows, when played, will come with a gradual crescendo. As you move your string up, your bow up, it will gradually get louder. With the downbeat, the longer you move in that one direction, the softer the sound gets. Um, you can also use the natural tendencies of your bowing to create in a more interesting uh, dynamic shape to your phrase. Um, so that's kind of what I did with this piece. All right, I wanted a very breath-like quality, breathing in and breathing out. So instead of starting with the default down bow, I'm actually starting with an up bow. So let's get our velocity layers up here. I'm going to say these are all up bows. That's a down bow. So then this is an up bow, down bow, up bow, down bow, up, down, up, down, up. And yeah, we're just kind of every time the bowing direction changes, uh, we are just changing the velocity. So these, all of these highlighted notes are my up bows. So all I'm going to do is I'm gonna take my velocity and make it just slightly, nothing too dramatic. We go up, we'll see, I wanna bring that up a little bit. Just something subtle, all right? I'm gonna make it lower. If I want to get a little more creative, I could say, I'm going to build those in, and then these are also going to build up since it's a series of notes. And uh, the idea being that as I continue bowing up, it gets louder. 
And doesn't really look like there are too many other series like that. I'm just going to keep moving up, making this a slight increase. And now we have essentially successfully mimicked the bowing of this piece. You can hear how there's some changes in the velocity as we go, the change in the volume. And right now it's a little jerky, all right? Because we're having sudden changes. We're going to move on to step four in a bit, which helps smooth those transitions and make it sound more realistic. But for now, let's make sure that we have addressed this in each of these as well. Um, so there's a break there. Then all of these are down bows, then up bow, down bows, up bows, and I'm going based off the overlap. Remember, all notes that are overlapped with each other in there are performed in a single bowing direction, while notes performed with a break in between them are experiencing a change in bowing direction. That's a change in bowing direction, change in bowing direction. So that would be an up bow. This is another change in bowing direction. This is all overlapped, so this is all done with one motion. So we've got another change here. Again, this overlap, this break here says that we change. This is all down bow, moving up, and then continue with this. This is also up bow. I have now identified all of my up bow performances. We are going to add a velocity here. Ah, oh, that sucks. Um, all right, well, I do this. I actually noticed I got a whole lot of comments here. Ah, all through Matt and Jack. Uh, Matt, can you recommend any libraries for Black Friday? Ooh, good idea. Let's let me see what Jack has to say here. Are you streams for Audio Imperial is a great channel. Oh, you have a Nucleus Core. So they have solo instruments. Nucleus does. All right, sounds good. But I only have my trouble checking the rules on the solo instrument. Great, thank you. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, it looks like you guys have this handled. Um, yeah, awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Matt, for taking care of that. Um, you know what? Maybe I'll do a video about library reviews. Those seem to be relatively popular. Um, I don't have all that many libraries personally. I mean, well, it's always subjective. Um, but personally, I just really love Spitfire libraries. I know some people are diehard fans, some people not so much. Um, but for me, they've always worked well. And the things I like about my sp uh, Spitfire libraries, like I mentioned earlier, the big one for me is I just get to have control over the individual notes or instruments. And for me, that is super important. I know that there are Spitfire libraries that don't have that intro. For example, my Albion One library is another ensemble patch, meaning that it's not broken up into first violin, second violin, it's broken up into high strings, low strings, high brass, low brass, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's just not personally what I like to work with. Uh, I like, like I said, I like the control. And here we go. The, ba the celli seem pretty straightforward. Um, again, I am highlighting all of my up bows. Again, the default would be the first beat or the down beat is a down bow. But I want to get a very deliberate breathing pattern of getting louder, breath in, then getting softer, breath out. So I'm going to, and then I just realized I did it again. Um, I forgot to add the velocity first, so we got to highlight all these again. And I'm just making sure that all of my down bows have a slightly softer velocity than my up bows. So now we have all three string sections are brought up to step three. It's getting there. We've got the general shape now. All right, we got another quote from Entropy Attic. Oh, yeah, you guys are still talking about the sound libraries. Awesome. Um, Yeah, that kind of let me just keep plugging along. If anyone has any questions about the process, let me know. Um, I'll consider putting out a video on sound libraries. That sounds like it'd be fun to do. Uh, so step number four is probably one of the more well-known strategies that you want to use modulation to create a smoother realism. All right, so modulation data in 
a MIDI project essentially tells your computer which samples to use. So in general for a sound library, the higher your modulation data, it's telling the computer use the samples of the piano being played, of the strings being played harder. Uh, a high modulation data means that you are putting a lot of pressure on those strings. A very light modulation data means you have a very soft sound, a very light pressure. So if we go to the string violins, we have the sound of very strong modulation. Then we're gonna go down. Very soft, there's such subtle pressure being applied that you almost can't hear it. All right, so this is technically a control for volume, but the difference between modulation and the other volume data we've provided is that modulation deals not just with volume, but also with the tone color, with the, so tound, so the sound quality itself. Now, like I said, this is a fairly popular, well-known uh, tool for creating a realistic uh, performance. What isn't quite as well known is a useful strategy for moving forward. Uh, lots of people typically say just use the modulation wheel, and I agree that is a fantastic strategy. Go for it if it comes naturally to you. Many beginners, it does not come naturally. So I want to share a more um, useful, if I can say that, strategy. And that is to first start with the modulation data. And all we're going to do is, actually, let's do modulation up here since it's a bit easier when it's compared, right? I'll just move the articulation and dynamics down here. Um, all we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, a down bow, a softer velocity. Let's start with a lower modulation. Then we have an up bow. So let's start with an upper bow has higher modulation because an upper bow has stronger pressure. Then we have another up bow. Let's bring it back down. A down bow, we're coming back up again. Then another down, up bow, we're just following the same pattern that we established earlier about keeping in mind the impact of our down bows versus our up bows. Uh, now remember, we started this. One second, so that's. Um, there we go. So we got. Uh, there we are. Uh, we started all of this earlier by planning where we would change bowing directions. Then we figured out which bowing directions would be an up bow, which ones would be a down bow. And all we're doing now is just kind of mimicking that shape and the uh, information we know based off the two premises, that an up bow is softer, a down bow is stronger, and that notes that are played in one bowing direction have a uh, general... They get slurred together while notes that are played by opposite become more um, detached from each other. So what I'm doing is I'm noticing this is where an up bow starts, so I go lower. Here, a down bow starts, so I'm going up higher. Uh, here, another down bow starts, I'm going lower. And here, I'm just being a little random with my shape. Uh, we have another down bow, star uh, bow starting, so it gets stronger. Here's our next up bow, uh, down bow, and then up bow again. Uh, but then again, it's a long held out note, so we're going to end by going up because remember, a down, an up bow becomes gradually louder. Once we have a general shape for our modulation, remember, for the strings, I've said this a bunch of times already, but an up bow, give it a softer modulation. The moment you have an up bow, a down bow, give it a higher modulation. Here we have a general shape, and it's going to become very jerky if we leave it like this. You can hear how the change in volume is taking place. So what we're going to do is if you are a beginner and you don't know how, and the modulation wheel doesn't come naturally to you, you are going to simply use the pencil tool. So I'm going to go to the grid. I'm going to change it again to a very small level. And all I'm going to do is connect the dots. So I'm going to come back down. Now you don't have to connect the dots perfectly. Just follow the general shape. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to draw it in. Just connecting the dots, I'm moving around. I'm gonna come back down a little bit and come up. And what's this gonna happen is it's going to create a much more fluid movement for us. I'm gonna come back down at the end because most phrases so end by becoming softer. And now we're gonna have now we're getting there. We're getting somewhere.
And we're just going to repeat this process for each of these instruments. Let's go to modulation. Let's add another, let's put our dynamics down here so we just know what we're working with so far. Modulation data again, looks like we're starting with an up bow. So that's soft. Here, uh, let's start with a larger uh, grid shape. Uh, let's see, uh, up bow, that's soft. We have our first down bow, we're gonna move up. Another up bow, we're coming back down. Another down bow, up, down bow, up bow, or nine, up bow, down bow, uh, up bow, down, up, down and I'm using this by following the velocity shape. So I know that this color is a lower velocity. So that means that it's an up bow. This is darker color is a higher velocity, which means it's a down bow. And all of this, if you're just joining now, we figured out through the previous steps. We've covered all the guidelines, we've covered all the tips. If you haven't seen it, you can go back and rewatch the video. And after the stream, I will upload the notes to the entire lesson plan. I was very detailed with this lesson plan. Um, so you'll be able to have access to that. But here we have another up bow, so we're gonna get softer. We have another down bow, up, down, up, down, and then up. So now again that we have our basic shape, I am going to use a much smaller subdivision to connect the dots. Now, it's very important that whenever you are trying to create realism, you want to avoid using copy and paste. So let's say that violin one and violin two are both playing this part right here. It makes sense in your head if they're gonna be doing that, you wanna just copy and paste the modulation data so you don't have to do it twice. Or you want to copy and paste the notes with their velocity levels so you don't have to enter it twice. And while that will save you time, it's going to hurt the realism of your sound because no orchestra, no performers are going to have 100% synchronization between violin one and violin two. Hell, I mean, there's not even gonna be 100% synchronization between violin one chair one and violin one chair two or any of the violin players. Everyone brings a slight change. So to, again, the whole point of trying to create as realistic of a sound as possible is to mimic the uh, performance uh, parameters that you would hear. So again, you would want to avoid copying and pasting. You'd want to do it fresh. This can be incredibly mind numbing. A lot of my students, when we first start talking about mockups, have a very similar feedback of this is so boring. This is, I, I hate all of the drudgery involved. But the final product will sound so much better the more effort you put into it. And at this point, I'm just kind of rambling, trying to make points because, of course, this takes time. All right, I'm connecting the dots. That wasn't the smoothest. Let's fix that. Coming down. And again, you don't have to follow the shape exactly. You don't have to hit every single dot. You just want to get a general shape following kind of the framework that you've set out. All right, almost there. And then we'll give it another listen. Hear how this sounds. And again, at the end, we will listen to the entire thing back to back, the original unaltered and the second one. Alright, let's see where the general levels are. So this one starts around 70. It sounds like they're out of balance a little bit. So you are going to have to double check. So the cello start around 70. Uh, violin 2, or viola starts at 71. And violin 1 starts on 84, 82. So that's all about close enough. So we'll have some, uh, we can always touch up on it here and there. Let's see, are there any other questions? Let's see here. Let's see here. My wish list broke. I'm whenever I use it, my music sounds right. <laughs> All right, that's funny, Jack. I like that. Uh, he says my modulation wheel is broken. Whenever I use it, my music never sounds right. Uh, yeah, the modulation wheel that was always very frustrating me before I started. People like just use the modulation wheel. Do what comes naturally. I was like, all right, but what? And then eventually, I found out. I was like, doesn't work because what came naturally to me as a trumpet and piano player 
was not necessarily what would come naturally to a string player. Um, Matt, uh, oh, a natural question. So what's the difference between modulation and expression? Sorry if this has already been answered. No, not at all. So modulation, there are three basically volume parameters. The first one is control, controller cha continuous controller number seven. That's the one that we set with our dynamics. This is the general volume for your track. All right, so this is basically how loud is this track. The modulation data then manipulates within those parameters to provide more volume feedback. But the thing with modulation is it's actually modulating through different samples. The sample being used for these notes down here is different from the samples being pulled for this one. Um, the higher your modulation is, it changes your tone color, just like a real instrument will change its tone color. A violin, when played very softly, will sound different from a violin playing very loudly. Even if you change the volume, you would notice if you mic'd up a violin to play them, uh, play, uh, hear them playing very softly, but at a loud level, it would still sound quiet because that's not the sound a violin produces when it sounds loud. Uh, expression is the third. It's similar to modulation. It deals with percentages. And that's what we're going to be talking about in just a second. Uh, so if you have like a middle point for expression, that says it's using 50% of the maximum volume your track is capable of. So while CC controller, uh, con continuous controller number seven, the, the track volume tells you what your maximum volume is, expression will tell you what percentage of that max volume are you using at any given point. Whereas modulation will say, what does your tone color sound like at these different points, essentially. Which actually brings us to step number five, which is very timely. Uh, step five is use, oh, wow. Uh, step five is use expression data to smooth out the sound. So there are generally two basic approaches you can take here, all right? Uh, one of the most popular is use your expression to create a similar but simplified shape as your modulation data. Again, all expression is, is what percentage of your maximum available volume are you going to be using? So if I wanted to do this, what I could do with the expression for this strategy, I would have my expression data up. I would have my general shape of modulation. I'd say for the most part, I like to use a higher expression with my strategy. So I would just kind of follow the same basic pattern just kind of tracing my idea, but much simpler. All right, so it's the same basic shape. I moved up when this one moves up, I moved down when it moves down, but it's not as exaggerated. And this helps kind of underline and unify all the things I've done so far. So I could do that. Another strategy would be, let's say I'm working with the violas. I decide I want my peak to of my entire phrase, the di the loudest moment of my phrase. Let's say, where's the highest note? It's about, let's just say here. Uh, for measure 15, let's just say this is my highest point. And then I am just going to very simply build into it, again, very subtly, and then come back down. Let's make it a little less subtle and create essentially just the shape of a hill. All right, we have our peak here, everything builds into it, then it builds back down. Either strategy is fine. Just personally, I prefer to use kind of the tracing strategy. Again, the trick behind expression is to just, ooh, I have a tendency to be moving down, uh, is to just kind of be subtle with your changes. You're not trying to create massive shifts. You're just trying to create a bit of glue holding together all of the different changes we've made so far. I'm going to do the same with our celli. We have, we're going to add our expression data, which again, one more time, I feel like a little broken record, but I want to make sure it's put, uh, all put together. Expression data is what percentage of your max volume available are you using? And the max volume available 
is set by controller number seven, which is the very first step I introduced here and what I'm using my dynamic markings for. That is something I know you can do in Cubase. I don't know if you can do it in other DAWs. I've never tried. Um, if not, again, all this is is continuous controller seven, main volume. So you can set it and then use that as a reference point, essentially, if you want to do say like, all right, I'm starting, this is my main volume I'm starting at. If I want it to be a lower dynamic level, I'll just move it lower. If I want a louder dynamic level, I'll move it up. But now we've, we're getting very close. We got all of this kind of stuff put together. Why do my violas sound so much quieter than everyone else? All right, so this is great. Maybe I just got a more dramatic. It could be that it could be a whole bunch of things. It could be that they're just not put in a good spot for like it's written in a very cluttered uh, section. Which could be, I don't think that's it because it doesn't sound this out of balance with the actual official version of this piece that I've arranged. So let's just try. A little bit of troubleshooting. What? So there's 12. My mic setup is similar. Routed? Yeah, it's routed correctly. All right, I don't know. I bet I could figure it out. Um, so for now, I can just kind of make different adjustments if I wanted to, but it's not that big of an issue. It's a support uh, line. Again, we're limited in time. I've only got like 10 minutes left before the plumbers are supposed to get here. Um, wish my landlord had talked to me ahead of time, but that's drama I don't need to bring here. Um, the last couple steps we have is first we have a little bit of more variability we can create uh, where we can mimic, this is optional, our changes. So in dynamic level. So uh, we can take this modulation data and say, all right, I'm actually gonna start on mezzo piano. I'm going to use my CC controller seven and I'm going to create general shapes to for my main volume uh, to kind of imitate the idea that we're working with moving bow lines. Now this is, like I said, optional. All you're doing here is basically taking your dynamics and you're following the shape of your modulation. All right, you're saying, all right, so it sounds softer, it gets louder, then softer again, then it gets louder again. And so you would just use your dynamic markings to mimic that shape if you wanted. Or you could use your, again, like I said, CC7 controller data to mimic that sound if you are not using dynamic shapes. So you could just do, again, kind of mimic whatever shape you're working with. That's not the strategy I'm working with. I'm working with dynamic levels. And since we are running out of time, I'm not going to try and be that particular. Uh, because the last one we need to talk about is something that often gets overlooked in a lot of mock-up videos and strings, and that is vibrato. All right, so vibrato, is essentially the player shakes the string. That's I know string players are going to be angry at me because that's not entirely true, but you're shaking the string just subtly and introducing a little bit of wobble to the sound. So we've got vibrato straight up. Let's mark it down all the way low. All low. So this is a C without vibrato. Let's increase that modulation. Why is it so quiet? Uh... Let's move that up here. Let's move this up. It's louder. No reverb, no vibrato. Let's do maximum vibrato. You can hear how it sounds a little less stable, a little richer, a little more wobbly. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. No worries. Let's make sure it resets. Yeah, it resets. All right, so now we're just going to, there are a couple basic ideas to keep in mind about vibrato. Um, 
Now remember, if you don't understand quite what vibrato is, I recommend looking it up. I wish I had time to go over it now. I don't, unfortunately, we are running very low on time. So the main idea here is vibrato is important. All right, look it up if you wanna learn more about it. But for now, I'm gonna to talk to you just about some actionable strategies you can use to manipulate it. Right, your vibrato. All right, a couple of basic ideas here. All right, stringed instruments. Instruments will, by default, use vibrato at all times, except for the basses. All right, so violins, violas, and celli will always use vibrato unless you tell them not to. The basses will not use vibrato unless you tell them use this. All right, in general, all right, let's see here. Um, stringed instruments will start with some vibrato and then add more as a note gets held out. This is kind of the default. However, again, if you are looking for more detail, you would say as the sound gets louder, they'll apply more vibrato. As a sound gets softer, they'll ease up on it. Again, I feel like I'm kind of like um, rushing in through this, speed running it, but uh, controller, continuous controller number 21 is usually vibrato. All right, so let's see here. Uh, let's add this continuous controller number 21. So again, building on the patterns we have used already, because we know that vibrato gets stronger as you get louder and kind of slower as you move down, you can perfectly fine trace your, let's do something a little bit smaller. Uh, you can perfectly just trace your modulation data again. So we can move it up. In fact, let's just use a straight line. Let's make these smaller. Let's make this a little bit smaller so we can make this larger. We're going to say we don't need to follow it completely. We just want to get a general shape. So it's getting up and it comes back down. All right. So we're going to come back down. We're going to go back up until about right here where it starts to come back down. Then you come back down again. And we're just going to, again, follow the general pattern. This isn't going to be as dramatic as, say, a volume controller. But it will still have a general impact on your tone quality. And you can experiment with different types of shapes if you would like. You can try finding different shapes that work well for you, different strategies that work well for you, and that kind of goes well with all of this. Um, here I'm kind of doing it just a little haphazardly. Actually, I'm not too happy with that. Let's change that. Um, so let's zoom in. Here we've got a gradual increase coming up all the way here for this measure. And then let's do eighth notes again, just so it's a little bit easier to control. Then we have another up bow, so it gets gradually louder again, so a little bit up there. Then we can come back down slightly. Then we have up bows again, so that's another increase pretty much to the entire measure. Then another up bow, come up, and again, We've got a down bow, so we'll come back down slowly. Then another up bow, so we've got an increase for most of the measure. In fact, yeah, let's just say all of the measure is an increase. Uh, again, another up bow. And again, you're resetting the vibrato with longer notes. This doesn't have to be as immaculate as the others. As I mentioned, I am kind of rushing through this because we are running out of time. In fact, I am just going to follow a very general shape for the other two instruments, which could also be a perfectly fine. Um, why is everything selected? It could be a perfectly fine strategy as well, which is controller number seven, which is every measure, reset your vibrato. Pick a pattern, move up, new measure, reset your vibrato, new measure, reset your vibrato. Make it a little different each time. Remember, no copying and pasting if you want to create as realistic of a sound as possible. We're always using at least some vibrato unless we... And then the basses, well, these are not basses. These are celli, so these will also be using vibrato. 
Um, one thing to note that is important is that stringed instruments cannot create vibrato or use vibrato if they're using an open string. Their finger has to be used to manipulate a string or the pitch if you want them to use vibrato. Uh, because, again, they're shaking the string with their finger. They can't do that if their finger is not touching the string. All right, we're just going to do it like this. Create a general vibrato shape. And there we have it. Let's give this a listen. I'm just going to increase the dynamic level to be able to listen one. I don't know why they sound so soft compared to the others. I'd have to do some digging that we don't have time for. Let's ease up on my computer a little bit. And then let's give a little comparison. Shall we? The changes will be subtle, but they're going to be very important. Uh, let's just change some general levels. We won't actually do anything with these. We're just going to set general levels uh, to begin with so that they aren't just starting randomly. Um, oops, I've got my alarm going off. It is 3 o'clock. Uh, mezzo forte, expression. And I use mezzo forte for this one, right? No, I use mezzo piano, so let's do mezzo piano as well. And then last one, Shelly's. We're going to listen to this, get a comparison, and then I can stay on for a little bit for questions. Um, so, yeah, start putting your questions down below if you want me to address anything. But let's give this a quick listen. Hear the difference. Very soft, probably should have chosen mezzo forte instead of mezzo piano. That is very soft. And now we get a performance where we actually played attention to all the different parameters. There we go. Like I said, the effect is subtle, but the amount of effort you put into creating a realistic performance in your pieces is going to really have an impact on how well you're able to stand out compared to the rest of the crowd. Um, every professional composer, orchestrator, arranger, um, MIDI mock-up professional artist, whatever, everyone has their go-to strategy to manipulate each of these parameters, every single one of them, these are kind of the basics that you need to understand in order to create the kind of sound that you want. So for future reference, this is going to go with this. I'm a little scatterbrained at the moment. I'm tired. Uh, I got a lot I got to get done left today. So it doesn't look like we have any other questions, um, but I'll sign off for now. All right. So as usual, if you have any questions for me, any topics you'd like to see me tackle in the future, let me know. I'll be uploading the actual full draft of the music that this is taken from in hopefully a few days. I just got to get the uh, final uh, feedback from the uh, from the person who, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I don't know. I'm tired. Um, so well, the person who hired me to write this. All right. So I'll be sharing that soon. Um, but yeah, anyone is any questions, feel free to send them my way. For now, I shall let you go, all right? So as always, keep studying, keep working hard, and keep writing new music. I'll be uploading the notes to this lesson in just a few moments, uh, so keep an eye out for that, all right? Have a great day, everybody.
拜拜。